very sorry it was my fault right it was muted um let's we'll, we'll start again so yes we were looking at the doctrine of the church last class uh, today we will be looking at the sacraments of the church uh, we began with the topic of water baptism uh, we looked at three points regarding why we must fall under the water baptism ceremony three uh, points on why we do it first to express our repentance in the time of john the baptist uh, the water baptism ceremony was specifically so that uh, people can show in public that they have repented and then the second uh, point that we saw is that uh, jesus declared that this is something that we should do to fulfill all righteousness so as an act of obedience we choose to uh, undergo the water baptism ceremony in the same way that jesus did the third reason why we uh, do this is so that we can publicly declare that we are followers of jesus in those times uh, the followers of a particular rabbi would undergo the water baptism to show that they are his disciples uh, for instance john the baptist when he baptized people they show today when we undergo the water baptism ceremony we are declaring that we are not just disciples of any human teacher but we are disciples of jesus christ himself so um, these are the three main reasons why we undergo water baptism uh, we also looked at uh, by whose authority this baptism ceremony is conducted uh, so we looked at acts 238 where it says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ so in jesus name by the authority which he has given uh, the leaders of the church baptize the believers so the authority to perform this ceremony to baptize people that authority is given by jesus to the leaders of the church and then um, from there let's move into uh, what kind of baptism is considered acceptable in the uh, scriptures especially when we look at the examples given in the um, early church so uh, if we could have any one person read out for us acts chapter 8 verses 36 to 38 acts 8 36 to 38 which talks about the uh, eunuch uh, to whom philip ministered acts chapter 8 verses 36 now as they went down the road they came into some water and the enoch said See here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Verse thirty-seven. Then Philip said, "If you believe with all your heart, you may." And he answered and said, "I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God." Verse thirty-eight. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the Enoch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Yes. So in those days, baptism was a common practice. people were aware of this um john the baptist used to baptize there were other rabbis also who performed uh, the baptism ceremony people would come to undergo the baptism ceremony to show that they are repentant of their sins and then after that they would formally start being taught by the rabbi by the teacher on how to honor god and how to follow god in the right manner uh, how to follow the mosaic covenant so these are all things which were part of this uh, baptism practice of those days so when philip said to the eunuch you know let's get in go to some water and uh, have the baptism the eunuch was not puzzled this was a custom that he was familiar with and he also understood that this baptism ceremony is not just going to bring him into the fold of some rabbi it's actually going to make him a disciple of jesus christ who was being talked about in the scroll in the isaiah scroll which he was reading uh, so they both get down from the chariot they go to the water and philip baptizes him over there so we see that in the early church all the uh, disciples and all the apostles used the uh, ritual of water baptism 
they did not use sprinkling baptism or uh, any other forms of baptism mainly probably because of romans chapter you know 6 that idea which is conveyed over there about a spiritual baptism so the complete immersion into the water better represents what is talked about in romans chapter 6 so we will look at that in a little bit of greater detail a little later but it is mainly because of the idea which is presented in romans chapter 6 about the spiritual baptism which we have all undergone at the moment of salvation so water baptism makes more sense because it in the in the sense there's an immersion right into the waters okay so um water baptism is generally considered uh, acceptable because of this uh, and one uh, another thing which we see from this uh, story of the eunuch is that you don't have to be very holy and grow in god and learn everything there is to learn about the scriptures before undergoing baptism you do uh, you you undergo the you can undergo the baptism immediately after your salvation experience so you get saved you place your faith in jesus you repent of your sins immediately one minute after that you can undergo the water baptism because there's a belief among some people that you have to live uh, that you have to reach some level of spiritual maturity before you can be water baptized but that is not what we see over here in many examples in the book of acts where people got saved immediately after getting saved within one day they would get baptized so water baptism uh, for water baptism you don't have to leave uh, reach some high level of spiritual maturity um, another thing that we see regarding the water baptism is that uh, you're doing this as a declaration of repentance of having accepted the lord as your master but just the ceremony on its own cannot make a person spiritually mature because the washing of the word will continue on a daily basis every day even as you meditate upon the scriptures the scriptures will cleanse you cleanse you in your mind in your heart so this that continuous cleansing and that continuous growth process is something that you go through throughout your entire christian life so just being water baptized does not make a person like christ you know completely christ like you do not arrive spiritually by just getting water baptized that's just the starting point after that you continue your walk with god uh, and then you grow stage by stage slowly uh, so water baptism on its own is not enough to bring about spiritual growth did you have a question go ahead ma'am uh, the scripture says in uh, john 3 5 mm. jesus answered very truly i tell you no one can enter the kingdom of god unless they are born of the water and of the spirit mm. correct so this kingdom of god is referred to being saved is my first question mm. and the second uh, thing is uh, uh, we grew up in uh, what do you call this uh, baptism a childbirth and mm. we've gone through a process of salvation by accepting jesus as lord and savior so where uh, is water baptism becomes mandatory for us if a person has undergone um, baptism as an infant would they need to do it again as an as a grown up is the question yes that's my second question ah. and the first question is uh, being saved is similar or is it the same as to enter the kingdom of god yeah so in that conversation that jesus was having with nicodemus he was talking to a, a pharisee someone who would be very familiar with the um, old testament scriptures and the people in the old testament were always constantly waiting for a day when the messiah would come to them and he would establish the kingdom of god on the earth so they always believed that a descendant of david would one day come and he would establish a physical kingdom on this earth where israel would get back its sovereign power uh, you know and the the all the foreigners who have been ruling over them would be defeated and driven out so that was the dream of the uh, old testament people so nicodemus was also looking forward to that kind of a physical kingdom and uh, so when he comes to jesus 
he wants to know whether jesus is going to be this messiah who will establish this physical kingdom on the earth but then jesus starts talking about spiritual concepts so he talks about a spiritual kingdom rather than a physical kingdom yes in the future a physical kingdom would be established on the earth uh, there are scriptures in you know in the old testament which talk about that but the first step is a spiritual kingdom being formed so jesus says to nicodemus if you want to be part of this spiritual kingdom you would have to undergo a second birth being born the first time is not adequate so you would have to undergo a birth by the spirit as well so um what would be the kingdom of god when jesus was talking over here he is talking about people becoming part of a kingdom where jesus himself is the ruler where he is the king of kings and lord of lords so everyone who becomes followers of jesus gains citizenship rights in a new kingdom under the lordship and kingship of jesus so what is the kingdom of god that jesus is talking about in this particular instance where nicodemus where, where the conversation with nicodemus is going on he is saying i am the messiah i am establishing a spiritual kingdom which of course ultimately would turn into a physical kingdom as well um so if you come and become my follower you become a part of this kingdom of god so yes a, a part of that concept would be that they would uh, after death people who are followers of who are citizens of this kingdom after death would go to heaven so in that sense the term saved can be used uh, so um, the people of that time the jewish people in their minds yes they were thinking of going into heaven to be with god but they also were deeply um, you know longing for a actual kingdom so nicodemus would have understood the term in both the spiritual sense and in the physical sense he would have gone on to think that one day he is going to be part of the physical kingdom of jesus and he also would have you know had that hope that yes uh, for eternity he will be with god and he will be raised from the dead you know that's the belief which even uh, uh, mary and martha had because that's what jesus taught them so this kingdom of god is a kingdom which enables you to be raised from the dead one day and you will eternally live with god in his kingdom so yes saved in that sense okay there's a bigger picture than just say uh, um going into heaven so they were thinking in terms of an actual kingdom which will come and establish itself on the earth under the rule of yahweh um the other uh, uh, thought about um, whether a person who has undergone infant baptism whether it would be necessary for them to also again undergo baptism as a grown up we will get to that point a little bit um later or okay let's deal with it right now okay um um so like i had said last time you know it was it's like in the last 5 minutes and i really could not get into much detail uh, so just to you know elaborate a little more on that point um the whole idea of infant baptism was first introduced by the catholic church um before the reformation before the time of the reformation so for uh, like i had said in the last class they basically believed that three things need to be done to be able to enter heaven so the first thing is that once the baby is born that baby would have to be baptized and uh, that will contribute towards that baby being you know washed clean of its sins and being made ready for salvation now as that baby grows up and you know starts understanding the the script uh, the rituals of the church and all of that one day i mean um, and when the child is around 11 12 or whatever then the child would also uh, start partaking in the lord's table uh, the wafer and the wine 
so that will be the second thing which the which a person needs to do to be able to enter into heaven and then throughout that person's life after this uh, after this step of having taken the sacraments that child would have to uh, that person who has now grown up would have to continue confessing their sins to a priest and doing penance for the sins which they have committed so these three things the church declared uh, the roman catholic church declared are important for a person to be able to enter into heaven and uh, so when the reformers came along you know martin luther and the other reform reformers they said salvation is by faith alone so the baptism ceremony cannot get you into heaven doing penance for your uh, sins cannot get you get you into heaven salvation is by faith alone so for the reform the reformers um protested against the catholic church and they came to be known as protestants you know because they were protesting against all the rituals and the man made customs that people were relying upon so um they protested against the catholic church and they started the reformation movement where people were were brought back to the scriptures and what the scriptures actually teach so in the beginning when martin luther you know took his uh, stand uh, saying that salvation is by faith alone he was very very clear about his stand on um the baptism ceremony this is what he said in 1520 in one of his writings uh, now this was a writing uh, called the babylonian captivity of the church so in that writing of his this is basically what he says um he says it is not baptism that justifies or benefits anyone but it is faith um in that word of promise in which baptism is added this faith justifies and fulfills that which baptism signifies those are the actual wordings which are there in that particular uh, you know booklet which he wrote this is basically what he is saying he is saying in that pamphlet in that booklet that um salvation cannot be gained by baptism it's the faith which you place in the promise that jesus has made it is that that faith which you are placing in the promise of jesus that will get you salvation and baptism only signifies that baptism is basically you acting out and showing that you have placed your faith in this promise in what jesus has said so he clearly emphasized that salvation is by faith and salvation is not by the baptism ceremony this was in 1520 two years later in a sermon in which he was preaching he again touched upon this idea and he said um faith without the uh, sacrament of baptism could still be salvific uh, what what would that mean in ordinary english he is basically saying even if a person has not undergone the sacrament of water baptism or whichever kind of baptism if the person has not undergone the sacrament of baptism even then the faith which they have placed in jesus will be salvific it it will gain them salvation so up to that point he was very very clear that your salvation is uh, depends on the faith which you place in jesus he does not say that your salvation depends on baptism then later on in life i'm not sure, exactly sure what happened um he kind of went a little off track in some of his teachings i mean um, martin luther is one person that we all respect and look up to because he's the one who took a stand along with some other you know good persons uh, good believers uh, against the catholic church and reestablished the authority of the scripture so we have great respect for him but there are a few things about him he was wrong in some of his teachings so later on in life um there was this group a denomination which developed known as the anabaptists the anabaptists who lived during his lifetime they said infant baptism was done to a baby 
the baby didn't even know what was being done the ba the baby could not open its mouth and say i have placed my faith in jesus for salvation so what was done for the baby cannot really have any spiritual significance so the anabaptist said when a person grows up he needs to make up his own mind whether he wants to place his faith in jesus or not so he will personally choose to place his faith in jesus make a declaration of that and as an adult he would have to undergo the water baptism ceremony again only then will it have spiritual significance and benefit for him so this is what the anabaptists said for some reason martin luther took a strong dislike to the anabaptists and he wanted to you know um critique them criticize them and so he wrote another um uh, booklet in 1528 which is called concerning uh rebaptism okay that's the uh, pamphlet which he wrote in 1528 and over here in this new booklet his his theology has undergone a change he says over here that baptism is like a bath for the soul that will recreate the sinner so now he started saying that it is baptism which will gain you your salvation it almost sounds like that because he says you know that when you undergo baptism it bathes your soul and it recreates you um is what he said in this book in this booklet and then he actually goes on to say the best kind of baptism is um okay the most certain form of baptism is infant baptism he says because he argues a grown up may lie about their faith you know they may go to the leaders of the church and say oh yes i believe in jesus and i have made a commitment to him but they may be lying a baby on the other hand cannot lie so um uh, baby is innocent so the most perfect form of baptism is infant baptism and it's a bath for the soul which recreates the sinner his um teachings seem to have gone very off track by 1528 when it came to this whole idea of baptism so um we are not exactly sure what he had against the anabaptists why he took this stand but later uh, many believers protestants agreed that what the anabaptists said is very valid because a baby cannot really express its faith in jesus it still does not even understand all of these uh, spiritual concepts so even if a person has undergone infant baptism it would be good for them to you know as grown ups publicly declare whom they believe in whom have they become disciples of and undergo the baptism ceremony especially because it also you know points towards romans chapter 6 and what has already happened to us spiritually so the lutherans believe very strongly in infant baptism because it's come down to them all the way from martin luther so they hold on to that and this one main scripture which the lutherans use even today that would be first peter chapter 3 verse 21 so if somebody could read out for us first peter chapter 3 verse 21 there is also an anti type which now saves us baptism not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience towards god through the resurrection of jesus christ so here in first peter chapter 3 verse 21 peter is saying that uh, the water is an anti type the water is a symbol of baptism what kind of a baptism does this water symbolize a baptism which doesn't just clean your the dirt on your body it's a baptism that gives you a clear conscience toward god in the sense it cleans you up on the inside and it gives you a clean conscience before god so peter basically says over here 
that water is a symbol of of a of a divine baptism in which god actually cleans up the person and gives them a clear conscience so here in this um verse peter is saying that the water baptism is a symbol which is pointing towards the divine baptism which god does inside a person so lutherans basically say a baby has to undergo the ceremony because when it undergoes the ceremony you know it it receives a clear conscience before god on the other hand if the child does not get water baptized and dies in its babyhood they say oh it it has not received that clear conscience from god but we need to observe this one fact peter when he talks about water and water baptism he says it is a symbol of the baptism which god does in giving a person a clear conscience so the water is a physical symbol pointing towards what god has done spiritually the divine baptism which has taken place inside us the water is a symbol it's pointing towards the divine baptism which has been done inside us uh, believers so romans chapter 6 verse 4 talks about the divine baptism which god himself did inside each person at the moment of salvation let's go to romans chapter 6 verse 4 we we uh, we have read this verse many times you know but to read it once again uh, romans 6 verse 4 romans chapter 6 verse 4 therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life all right so this is something that the early church was teaching the believers in that moment when you place your faith in jesus something divine happens to you we have talked about this again and again you know in our uh, different doctrines that old sinful fallen spirit being that you and i were that person literally dies along with jesus gets crucified with him gets buried with him through baptism into death so it the, the waters are like death okay i mean if you're comparing it to the water ceremony water baptism ceremony the person is buried along with jesus in death but that person doesn't stay dead because in the same way jesus christ was raised up the believer is also raised up and when he is raised up he no longer comes out as the old sinful spirit being now when he comes out he comes out as a new living being so these are the um this is the baptism into the death of christ and a resurrection along with him being raised along with him and it says in that verse romans 6 for last portion so that we too may live a new life so now we are living this new life as a new spiritual being a new spirit being so this what god has divinely done for us in the moment of salvation first peter 3 uh, 21 is telling us that the water baptism is a symbol of this of what god did in romans 6 4 so the water baptism is only symbolizing that so doing that to a baby without the baby is even understanding what you know is being done does not help in any way on the other hand when a grown up who has understood what jesus has done for them having understood it when they undergo the water baptism they are doing it consciously saying this is what god has done for me in the spiritual realm and now i am acting it out physically so that everyone knows that this is what has happened to me on the inside and now i am a new creature on the inside so you act it out physically as a symbol of what was done to you at the moment of salvation by god himself in romans 6 4 okay so therefore it makes more sense for a grown up to undergo this ceremony and so if a person has undergone um, infant baptism it is um, did not hold any significance for the baby when the baby underwent it but as a grown up when that person can do it consciously knowing what jesus has done for them 
believing that what Jesus has done is effective and making a choice that because it is effective, they are now going to follow him. And so with that awareness, when they undergo the water baptism ceremony, it uh, gains spiritual significance and the power of God is released into that believer's life. You know, in the in last class, the thing that we uh, mentioned is that why are we observing these two sacraments of the church? Not just because it's a nice ritual. We are doing these two things because it actually releases divine power into our lives. So when a person undergoes this water baptism ceremony, having understood why they are doing it, having understood the spiritual significance of it in Romans chapter 6, and when they do it consciously, having understood what they are doing, because they have believed fully in what Jesus is, has done, God's power is released into their life. So they actually are able to start living in a new way, just like it says in Romans 6.4. They realize that I have been raised up along with Jesus, and now I am a new spirit being. So yes, I can live in a new way. And the power which is released into their life because of the faith which they now have, that power starts changing them. It starts sanctifying them. So we don't just do it because it's a nice ceremony. We are doing it because, because, of the, because out of faith. And because we are doing it as a faith step, literally the power of God is released into our lives. And we are able to start living in a new way, just like it says in Romans 6.4. So, um, you know, if any of us who are watching, if we have not yet undergone the water baptism ceremony, you know, now that you are aware of what was done in Romans 6.4 at the moment of salvation, now that you have understood that, act it out by actually going into the waters, you know, because then you will really be physically acting out what was already done for you by Jesus. And because you have, you're doing it as a step of faith and saying, yes, I believe that this is what Jesus did for me. His power will be released into your life and it will help you to, uh, to, uh, to become more and more renewed in your new uh, life, which Jesus has given you. Okay, so this is the spiritual significance of the um, water baptism ceremony. The water baptism ceremony is pointing towards this spiritual truth. All right. Um, yeah, if no one has any questions, we will move into the other sacrament. If anyone posts any questions here, I you know I can answer. But otherwise, we will get into the second uh, sacrament, the second spiritual ritual which we perform. That would be the Lord's table. So, um, we celebrate the Lord's table because, again, we are doing this as a step of faith, saying that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, and in what we, and, in, and our belief in the victory which this has produced. Okay, so um, the first reason why we participate in the Lord's table is to affirm and acknowledge and say, yes, I really believe that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus was resurrected and he rose up victorious. So now I am participating in, the, in his death to sin. I am also participating in the resurrected life where I can now live as a free person, free from the bondage of sin. So you're when you're taking the Lord's, uh, the elements in, in the, you know, at the Lord's table, you are literally saying, I believe in the work of the cross and I'm choosing to participate in this work of the cross, which is what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. So if someone can read out for us, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Fifteen, sixteen. First Corinthians ten, sixteen. Isn't that the correct verse? Yes. The cup of blessing which mm. we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, 
is it not the communion of the body of christ yeah um in the version uh, which you read out uh, you know it says communion which is a more um, not a very familiar word you know in our normal everyday english so niv puts it as participation so it says is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of christ and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of christ so we are literally saying yes i believe in what jesus has done on the cross for me and now i am participating in it so you literally physically act it out by eating that wafer by drinking that juice even as you're doing it you're saying i fully believe that i too have died to sin that now through jesus i too have been raised to a new life i will now have victory in all aspects of my life because of what jesus has done for me so you're literally acting out your faith so in the same way the water baptism was a step of faith where you are you you're saying yes i have risen up from the from the you know from the waters of the grave into a new life in the same way even when you're participating in the elements you're saying yes i'm literally participating in what jesus did on the cross for me it's a declaration of faith and when you take it with this awareness that you are literally participating in the victory which jesus has won for you the power of god is released into your life so both of these things that we are doing we are doing it in faith and when we believe and act it out the the power of god is released into our life okay so um so uh, the lord's table participating in it is an expression of our faith in the death burial and resurrection um also the second thing which the lord's table um expresses it expresses the fact that we are now in union with the lord you know we we looked at that just now in first corinthians 10 16 we are in union with him we have participated in his um death burial and resurrection and now with the new life which we are living we are still in union with him so the union didn't just happen you know at that moment of salvation where you participated in the death burial and resurrection of jesus you continue to be un- in union with him so when you're holding that wafer and you're holding that grape juice not only are you saying yes i believe on the in the work of the cross and that i am now participating in it you are also saying i continue to choose every day to abide in this jesus so you are continuing to be in union with him on a daily basis um and not just that you are also in union with other believers now that would be you know so because first corinthians 10 16 talks about you participating in the blood and body of christ and the next verse this is what it says so if someone could read out um uh, just so that we have we get a kind of revision if you could read out both the verses verse 16 and 17 first corinthians 10 16 and 17 so there are two aspects being mentioned over here yeah first corinthians 10 yeah go ahead 16 and 17 the cup of blessing which we bless bless is it not the communion of the blood of christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of christ for we though many are one bread and one body for we all partake of that one bread yes so yes you are in union with the lord like it says in verse 16 but never forget you are also now in union with all the other believers because all these other believers are one single body and jesus is the head so you can't act like a ro- lone ranger you know saying oh me my family and my faith i know and whatever happens to the other believers you know i don't care no now you see you're part of that one body you are you are part of that one loaf so if you're sitting over there with a the wrong attitude towards other believers then you really are not taking partaking of the lord's table with the right attitude so you need to be aware that you are in union with the lord but you also have to be aware that you are in union with the uh, with the rest of the body of christ 
you can't just separate yourself uh, self from them and say i know i don't care about them so it says over here because there is one loaf we who are many are one body for we all share the one loaf that one body of jesus we are sharing in it and now we have become part of him and we are participating in him as one body so un unity among believers is equally important we are in union with the lord we are also we also need to be in union with one another which is why uh, you know if you look at it from this context Ephesians 4:29 to 31 becomes very very significant if we can have someone read out Ephesians 4:29 to 31 which talks about what attitude we should have towards one another you know in the family of Christ Ephesians 4:29 to 31 let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption let all bitterness wrath anger clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another even as god in christ forgave you yeah ah uh Yeah, I was looking at a question posted there, but yes, um, those those verses are very significant. Okay, let's just complete this thought first. So, imagine you are now you are one body along with all the other believers, and together all of you are participating in the uh, in the in the in the in the you know work of the cross of which Jesus has done for us. So now you can't be divided among yourselves. and efficiency 4 29 to 31 actually emphasizes that you know if people are having unwholesome talk against each other backbiting each other criticizing each other you know if they are um, entertaining bitterness towards each other like it says in verse um 20 um verse 31 yeah it says there is rage and anger brawling and slander you know um, slander is basically you saying bad things about the peer about about another believer along with every form of malice if you're indulging in all of this what happens it grieves the holy spirit of god with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption so that word grieve which is over there it literally talks about almost physical pain it's something that you that is very very hurting for god because you are actually hurting his body you know i mean if i were to take a blade and if i were to cut my finger it's such a painful thing i mean it's something that i'm doing to my body so in the same way when all the believers are the body of you know jesus if the if the members of the body are hurting each other and cutting each other with their words and their attitudes and their actions it literally grieves it hurts so that word grief it talks about emotional pain but it's an emotional pain that greek word it's an emotional pain that almost is physically hurtful that is basically what you would be doing to the holy spirit when you are living in bitterness towards another believer or you're speaking uh, unwholesome words which will drag them down or you're slandering them behind their back all of these are highly dangerous attitudes so when we sit you know with the elements in our hand the wafer and the grape juice it's not just enough to ask ourselves oh you know did i honor the lord this week we also need to ask ourselves did i honor him in the way i treated the rest of the body of christ and if there are wrong att attitudes in your heart you would need to correct them because the the lord's table not only is pointing towards the finished work of the cross it is also pointing to the to the fact that one, there is one loaf and all of us are participating together in that one loaf who is jesus you know we are feeding on him 
and we are receiving new life from him uh, so that unity matters um yeah we have about 3 minutes left please if i don't need the audio feedback mute it okay, sorry uh, some some issues here yeah so coming to parmita's question uh, she is she has said that you know she was she did not receive the certificate which you know certifies saying that a person has been water baptized and now she has moved uh, this not her but a friend of hers yeah a friend of parmita's um, did not receive her water baptism certificate from the church where she had undergone that uh, you know that uh, sacrament and then she moved to a new church and in the new church they are uh, because of the custom they have in their new church they are not allowing her to participate in the lord's table because she does not have her water baptism certificate so the simple question is can she just undergo the water baptism uh, you know ceremony once again so that she can get her paperwork so that you know she can participate in the lord's table i think it is perfectly fine because how many ever times the believer does it they are basically pointing towards the divine work which jesus did which the holy spirit did inside that person at the moment of salvation because what was divine the divine baptism it happened you know uh, in uh, what is mentioned in romans 6 4 and first peter 3 21 that actually took place it was a divine baptism done by god's hands so that happened that has already taken place now you're only physically acting it out so now this because this particular person has not been given the paperwork which is required for us to you know um to participate in the activities of the church and all of that if she does it a second time she's just simply acting it out a second time and you know uh, uh, telling people this is what god did for me divinely at the moment of salvation so it is not necessary for a person to do it again and again but in her case because of her circumstances if she does it there is absolutely nothing wrong in it because she is only pointing towards a divine work which was already done inside her by god himself she is only physically acting it out so i believe it's my personal belief that yes it would be perfectly all right for her to do it uh, you know uh, one more time but is it necessary for you know all of us believers to keep doing this on a daily i mean on a, on, a, on a regular basis maybe once in 3 years once in 4 years not necessary because uh, you make the public declaration once you know so um, but in her situation yes it would it would make sense for her to uh, do that all right thank you we'll uh, you know continue when we get back from the break